Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! was the most effective and standout slogan from the Brexit campaign, take back control. Well, later we'll start to hear more about what taking back control might look like. The European Union withdrawal bill represents the biggest constitutional change in the UK since the 1970s, as thousands of EU laws and regulations, about 12,000 I think, are effectively downloaded into British law. MPs will start debating it with Labour planning to oppose it because they say it gives too much power to the government rather than elected MPs in Parliament. Once informally known as the Great Repeal Bill, the now less grandly titled European Union Withdrawal Bill faces its first big test in Parliament today. But what is it and why does it matter? Well, the idea is to do the biggest cut and paste job in parliamentary history by moving 40 years worth of EU law straight into UK law. Then, when the UK formally leaves the EU in 2019, Britain will be able to change those laws as it sees fit. Sounds straightforward enough, doesn't it? So what's all the fuss? Well, the bill also includes controversial powers nicknamed Henry VIII clauses, after the 16th century king who introduced a statute of proclamations that gave him power to make laws without Parliament's consent. Critics fear these powers would allow ministers to change legislation without the scrutiny of Parliament. As a result, the opposition Labour Party have vowed to vote against it. They say it grants too much power to ministers to, quote, slash people's rights at work and reduce protections for consumers and the environment. The government says it won't use the powers to make significant changes and has warned that if the bill doesn't clear the Commons, it could create a legal vacuum when the UK leaves the EU in 2019. Since the last election, the government has a wafer-thin majority, with only just enough MPs to get new laws passed. But if this bill, or one like it, isn't passed by the time the UK formally leaves the EU, Britain could find itself in a king-sized legal model. Let's talk to Mark Harper from the Conservatives, Stephen Gethins, who's the SNP's Europe spokesperson. And in a moment, we'll speak to Labour MP Peter Kyle when he joins us. Uh, morning to you both. Good Mark morning, Harper, morning. the former Attorney General, your colleague, mm -hmm. Dominic Grieve, says no sovereign parliament should pass the EU withdrawal bill. Is he wrong? Well, I, I'm very happy with the bill. I've looked at the bill. I think so it he does, is wrong. I think it does what's necessary. It takes all of the European legislation that's currently passed in secondary legislation and puts it all into British law so that on the day we leave, we get a very smooth exit. It's worth saying, of course, that the legislation that it's going to m move was all passed into law through the same processes with secondary legislation. Uh, and I didn't hear lots of people complaining about that at the time. Um, so I think it's a necessary process. The House of Lords Constitution Committee looked at it and said, in an ideal world, you wouldn't do it like this. But they accepted that because of the volume of legislation, this was necessary. They said the government should limit the powers that ministers are going to have, and the government has. So the powers ministers have they can't use it, for example, to create taxes or to make retrospective legislation. No, but they can it's dump for, any bits they don't like for, if they want. Well, actually, no, it's for tweaking the legislation. And, of course, all of those powers that ministers... Tweaking sounds so well, benign. Well, it is. And all Stephen the, and all the, well, well, and all, what are you worried about? And all the well, powers well, I mean, that ministers I, I, exercise I, I, are all reviewable by the courts. Well, so look, I'm very well, well, relaxed well, well, about but it. But not First, elected MPs. First of all, I'm astonished to hear um, Mark talk about nobody ever complaining. We've had years of Eurosceptics complaining about European laws that the UK government actually signed up to, because of course the UK, the UK government remains sovereign when we're part of the European Union. But also this power grab, and that's what it is, a power grab that the House of Lords have been concerned about, Law Society of Scotland have, have, have illustrated concerns, takes power back from Parliament. Parliament doesn't have the powers over this legislation. These Henry VIII clauses that, that, that they're using, why not give back control to Parliament? Well, and on, and on the What's devolved administration, we'll give, give Parliament a say. Because one thing well, that's missing... You, sorry, well, sorry, sorry, sorry. One you're thing that's missing, today, Victoria, tomorrow, well, Monday. What do you mean, give two Parliament solutions, a say? Two solutions. One, on areas that are devolved competences, 
give the devolved administrations in Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland say over those. Don't restrict what they can legislate on or what they can't legislate on, which is what this bill does. It restricts the devolved competences okay. there. On the parliamentary side, give Parliament proper scrutiny. Now, they're restricting the days we can debate this. And one thing that's astonishing, if the government had the courage of its convictions, if it was confident of what it was doing, it would be perfectly comfortable with parliamentary scrutiny. But it's not. OK, well, let me bring in Peter Carr from the Labour Party. Thank you for joining us, Mr Kyle. Um, you will tell me that your party is definitely not trying to block Brexit when it votes against uh, the second reading of, the, of this bill, but that will be the perception amongst some people, some voters out there who voted for Brexit. Well, I can say categorically, and I'm in a good place to say this, that the party is absolutely not trying to block Brexit, and I'm somebody who has voted against Article 50, and I broke the Labour whip. I believe that our country was fundamentally unprepared and our government was unprepared for the negotiation period okay, so and also then. unprepared why, why, for, to, for the legislative consequences of Brexit. Right. And today's what, so power what? grab is absolute proof positive that our government did not give the time, did not give the consideration and is unprepared for the whole Brexit process that they are ramming through Parliament right. with too little time. OK, so how, but how are you going to convince people that this this concern about parliamentary sovereignty is not simply masquerading you trying to put hurdles in the way of the government completing Brexit. Because it's two separate things. Article 50 and the vote for Article 50 triggered <coughs> the Brexit process. This is about how we do Brexit and getting Brexit right and getting a Brexit that's right for Britain. And what's your now, solution? Now, I am still sceptical that there, are, there is possible to deliver what? a Brexit that's good for Britain. When what? you look at all the leaks coming out of government and you see the shambles of a, uh, of a, of a, of a negotiation process that's unfolding okay. around us. So what but is it specifically... I'm telling you that this, Sorry, Mr that, that, Carl, that, that what is it specifically is that Labour is suggesting? Because, as I understand it, there are something like 12,000 regulations under EU law that we're going to download. Now, you're not talking about scrutinising all those pieces of... Why not? How long will that take? Well, it should take as long as it takes. How but if this whole if, if, if Brexit was about parliamentary sovereignty, then we give sovereignty to Parliament. Okay, Mark what Harper, you don't just, do just is take parliamentary sovereignty away. Well, right. actually, so what would be wrong? Well, Victoria, I think that was actually a very enlightening answer because what that really says is the, if, if you went through every single one of those regulations, which, by the way, didn't have that level of scrutiny when they became law in the first place, and, this is what people and, the, Labour, for, isn't and the Labour Party was very happy to do that. If you were to do that, this process would never finish. And the real agenda of the Labour Party is they want to kick and push down the road us leaving because many of them we want to hope right, that it will Mark. never happen. Yeah. And if we leave uh, at two years' time, or in March 2019, we haven't moved all this stuff into British law, then it will be a chaotic exit. Businesses, the but public, so and important. people will suffer. Do you not We've got to do it Peter properly. Carl's point about doing it properly? It takes as long yeah. as it takes. But literally all we're doing is we're taking these pieces of secondary legislation, mm -hmm. which currently rely on European legislation to be law, and we're moving them into British law. Mm. The powers that are going to ministers are to enable small changes where, for example, you need to change the name of an institution. The government have been very clear that any significant changes will be done through primary legislation, through the full parliamentary okay, process. Do you not and I think that's you, very sensible. Do you not believe that, Stephen Gethin? Well, look, first of all... Sorry, look, do you the, not believe that? Well, that Mark, Mark, Mark setting... No, I, I, I don't. I mean, these assurances, Mark trying to tell us that, oh, it's, it's not that bad. Look, Dominic Grieve, former Attorney General, now we sit on opposite benches of very different views, very real concerns about this. Because one thing, and this is something that I think that's really important, this has a huge impact on everybody, on our environment, on opportunities, Opportunities for young people on the economy, on jobs. The economy will take a massive hit from this process. Just so it takes as Harvard, long as it takes, and parliamentary scrutiny is important. Now, okay. I, I agree with Peter when his concerns about ramming this through Parliament. What is the point in having a Parliament if it's not there to scrutinise, if it's not there to ask the government questions, especially in something that will affect each and every one of us in such a, a, a devastating way as this will? Peter Kyle, your Labour colleague, Kate Hoey. Uh, who voted to leave the European Union, says anyone who votes against the principle of this bill, which is what you're debating this afternoon and for the next few days, is betraying the will of the British people. That's one of your own colleagues. She's wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> she's wrong. She's in, a, she's in a tiny minority within Labour. She's in a tiny minority within Parliament. On this particular point, she is simply wrong. When Labour were in power, Mark and his party voted against Labour if we brought in a bill which had more than 10 or 11 statutory instruments that were giving more powers 
to government and they repeatedly said it was a power grab. They are introducing a bill today that is going to have over a thousand pieces of legislation, power, which is rammed away from Parliament into government, out of the hands of civilians, out of the hands of democratic scrutiny. Okay, well, let this Mark bill is pernicious, that. it is wrong. No, I, I don't agree with that. It's a, it's a practical measure. The House of Lords Constitution Committee said this no. is the only way it can reasonably be done. They did say ministers, the powers should be constrained. And there's very clear prescription in the legislation that limits the powers that ministers will have. Mm. Um, and I, I looked at the bill last night in preparation for this, and I'm very clear that there are lots of controls in there, and I'm very content with them, and I'll be supporting the bill on Monday. Are, are you not happy with the limits that are in there, then, Peter Kyle? What, why don't you believe them? Uh, I'm sorry, the limits, in, but no, there is no limits in, the pa in this bill. This, pill do, this bill does not just give uh, a thousand statutory instruments and, and a thousand different mechanisms for ministers and civil servants to take decisions that are going to affect our air no, quality, it, our no, sea quality, the food quality, no, no, it, it right across the raft of regulation for our no. country. It is also giving the power to overturn different pieces of legislation. This bill, for example, will give the power to ministers to leave, to finally leave leave the European Union without coming back to Parliament for the final vote. They give power to government that could even overturn this particular piece of legislation. The power given to government by this bill is overweening. It is unprecedented. No, we need time to scrutinise and get Brexit right. I think Brexit is going wrong and we need to stop and think about it, but I am fully behind Labour's position right now, which is okay. to get this yeah. bill right and get every step of the way right. Otherwise, we are going to damage our country in the most pernicious and vandalistic way. OK. Um, quick final thought, Mark Harper, mm -hmm. in your summer recess, Theresa May announced she was planning to stay on to fight the next general election. Are you happy about that? I want the Prime Minister to get this Brexit negotiation done and, are, are you and happy get it about done her properly. announcing that she's planning she, to stay on? She said before to, the, to MPs at Westminster that she's going to stay on as long as we want her to. I think she's doing well, a she, great job negotiating the Brexit deal. Since then, she deal. said she's planning and, to stay on to fight the next general election. I are want, you going to support that? I want her to Hardly continue endorsement. getting this Brexit legislation done and then I want her to bring forward the legislation that she said she was going to do yesterday in Parliament, all the other challenges facing Britain around productivity, about rising wages, job creation, I think she's doing a great job and I want her to stay and get that done. And do you want her to stay on as she announced that she will be doing to fight the next general election? I want her to stay on and deliver the things that she said she was going and to at the general, the next election. general election. We've got, plenty, we've got a five year parliament. Uh, I want her to get on and deliver for the British people okay. uh, Are you the things happy? she promised she would do at the election this year. Are you I'm happy? very happy to defend and support her as she does that. What about the question that I've asked you a number of times? Are you happy? that Theresa May has announced she's planning to stay on to fight the next general election. I am very content to support the Prime Minister. I think she's doing a great job. To I fight the to next get, general election. I want to get this Brexit legislation done. I'm very happy with the position that she's got as leader of our party and Prime Minister of our country. And to fight the next general election, you'd support that or not? Uh, look, I'm happy. She said she'll stay as long as the Parliamentary Party wants her yeah, to. Since she said um, that, she's then I am very announced, as you know, that she will be I staying am, on to fight the next general yeah, election. Yeah, I am very happy with what she's doing leading our country, and I'm very happy to continue supporting her for as long as she wants to stay as Prime Minister. Into the next general election? Well, for as long as she wants to stay as Prime Minister. She wants to fight the next general election? Well, then I just said I'm happy to support her for as long oh. as she wants to stay as Prime Minister. OK. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mark Harper and uh, Mark Harper from the Conservatives, Stephen Gethins from the SNP, Peter Carr from the Labour Party. Thank you very much for coming Thank onto you. the programme. Now, as I say, it's a big day in Westminster as the debate begins on the government's flagship Brexit bill. The European Union Withdrawal Bill, as it's known, begins its second reading in the next half an hour or so. It's a major piece of legislation which is designed to give legal continuity once we leave the EU. So what exactly will MPs be discussing in the first parliamentary test for the government's Brexit policy since before the summer recess? Well, the main role of the bill is to repeal the European Communities Act of 1972 and convert thousands of pieces of EU legislation into UK law. But some controversial elements have meant the bill can't expect an easy passage through the Commons. Many MPs are concerned about how the government will exercise so-called Henry VIII powers, which would allow ministers to make changes to laws to implement any withdrawal agreement after Brexit, sometimes without a vote in Parliament. Labour has already issued a three-line whip to vote against the bill, 
and the Lib Dems and SNP will join them. Tories like Anna Soubry, who are critical of the government's Brexit policy, have ruled out a rebellion over the bill's second reading when a vote is taken on Monday. But they may take the opportunity to join with members of the opposition in causing trouble for the government over a so-called programme motion. Ministers want to limit debate in during the bill's committee stage to eight days, but many MPs believe there needs to be more time for scrutiny. And even if it clears that hurdle, the government faces the prospect of seeing hundreds of amendments tabled when the committee stage begins in the Commons after the party conferences. Well, earlier, the Brexit minister, Steve Baker, told the House of Commons why the powers granted to the government in the bill were so expansive. Mr Speaker, the powers in the bill have been drawn widely in order that this country, this parliament, can meet the imperative of delivering a working statute book on the day we leave the European Union to deliver certainty, continuity and control and on the area that the Honourable Gentleman raises in order to implement the withdrawal agreement in a way that allows us to leave the European Union smoothly and successfully. Well, that was Steve Baker in the House, and in a moment I'll be talking to representatives from Conservative and Labour. But first, Lizzie Glinker is on College Green, soaking up the atmosphere. So, Lizzie, set the scene for us. Soaking up is right, Joe, because we're having a <laughs> glorious morning here on the green with all this rain. Uh, you can see behind me uh, excitement building, broadcasters uh, from around the world. You can see CNN, our uh, BBC colleagues over there, and one lone... Uh, protester has arrived in the last few moments. Uh, we don't know if more of those are going to be turning up uh, in the next hour or so, but at the moment there is one chap and you can see that he is uh, getting plenty of attention from the cameras over there. Well, we can speak now to Stephen Gethin from the SNP. Uh, Stephen, thank you. And we have an umbrella as well, which is great news. Uh, Stephen, what's the problem with this bill for you? Well, I think there are a large number of problems and a large number of these problems that go back to the blank page from vote leave. And frankly, the government not doing its job over the past 15 months. But look, part of the problem is the delegated legislation. You know, we're handing over rights over human rights over the devolution process. Now, this is a huge power grab, biggest power grab that we've seen. It was meant to be about democracy and taking back control, but we're handing back control to a Tory government. And yet, Ian Duncan Smith said this morning, you know, this is really a bit of a fuss about nothing. They've said they're going to talk to you about the devolved powers. It's even in the notes of the bill. So are you just making a bit of a fuss here? Do you know what? Ian Duncan Smith doesn't have good form on this. He's somebody who wants to leave the European Union regardless of the consequences to the economy, opportunities for young people. If you actually look at the bill, and in the bill, you've got areas that over, over, over devolved competences. It says that the, the Scottish Parliament and the other devolved administrations can't legislate over areas that are coming back. Now, that seems unreasonable. Monday's the 20th anniversary of the devolution referendum that established the Scottish Parliament. And it would seem like a real shame that on the day that we commemorate the 20th anniversary, that's the day that Westminster is taking back control from the devolved administrations, reversing the devolution process. That's not just a concern of the SNP and the Scottish Parliament parliament but also labor in the welsh assembly you've got law society of scotland a whole range of organizations and political parties really worried about this really worried but you sort of touched on on the nub of it there really you mentioned ids he just wants to leave you just wanted to remain so are you not really just trying to hold this up you're trying to cause trouble delay it which will cause bigger well, problems for Brexit look, in the long term. The, the Scottish government's the only government that's come up with a compromise to say, look, the UK, Scotland voted two to one to remain part of the, of the EU. The UK voted to leave. Let's compromise. Let's stay part of the single market. It was never on the, the ballot paper. Ruth Davidson, the Tory leader, even said, you know, let's look at the single market after the referendum last year. So we're looking at compromise. Now, what is the point in having a parliament? What's the point of me coming down to Westminster if we don't scrutinise the work, not least on this bill that will have an impact on all of us, on the environment, opportunities for young people, the economy, human rights, all these big, big areas. That's our job is to scrutinise. And what's striking is the government seems to be scared. It doesn't have the courage of its convictions to stand up and put these bills before parliament. And that's something that I find really worrying. But a lot of this can be discussed in the committee stage. That's what the government are saying. We're talking about thousands of pieces of legislation here. If we don't just get this done, it's going to completely, it's going to have a huge impact on, on the negotiations. And, and you're just setting but out to no, mess that for, up. For, for all the reasons that I've set out, on areas like human rights, on the devolution process, the, the government has got the bill wrong. Now, if I think the government's got the bill wrong, 
then I vote against it. That's my job. And the government shouldn't be scared of scrutiny. I was hearing all this stuff about democracy, bring back control to Parliament, where actually the Tories just want to bring back control to them and Whitehall and make all the decisions. That's not the way it works. And it's certainly not the way it should work with a minority government, where parties should be pooling together and trying to work together, because this is big and it's bigger than any one party. OK, Stephen Gethin, thank, thank you, you very much. There you are, Joe. An interesting day ahead. Lizzie, thank you. Now, as promised, I'm joined now by the Conservative MP Mark Harper, formerly Chief Whip under David Cameron, and by the Shadow Brexit Minister Jenny Chapman. Welcome to you. both of you. Mark Harper, can you tell us why people shouldn't be worried about ministers having discretionary powers to change UK laws? Well, yeah, for, for a start, Stephen's got his facts wrong. Well, so so the, the reason why they shouldn't is, but it's relevant, because the powers are constrained. So in the the, act, the bill that's going to be before that's before Parliament getting its second reading today, it specifically, for example, doesn't allow ministers to use those delegated powers to change anything about the Human Rights Act or the equivalent legislation in Northern Ireland. Can you Ireland. change any primary legislation so without change, going... You can change right. some of it. So you can change, well, you can change primary legislation that would normally is, be scrutinised by Parliament. Which is not unprecedented. And it's worth remembering the, well, the secondary legislation which is being brought into British law by this bill. Mm. Most of it was, of course, passed into law by exactly the same process. But you know there's been layer upon layer of laws and mm -hmm. legislation, and that makes it yeah. difficult to unpick. So let's just be clear. You can change primary legislation, which, or to... I take your point that it's not unprecedented, mm -hmm. um, but it isn't usual well, practice, no. and Parliament would be um, able to scrutinise. So my question was, why, why shouldn't people be worried? Because the Constitution Committee of the House of Lords, which is not known for being terribly keen on uh, leaving the European Union, was very clear. It said, and it accepts, you normally wouldn't do this but it accepted that because of the volume of legislation that needs to be brought onto the statute book by March 2019 so that we have a smooth exit and that people have legal certainty practically you've got to do it in this way and it said that when the bill was published the government should constrain the scope of that and the government has done that so for example it can't pass laws that mm. change taxes or change the Human Rights Act right. or create criminal offences so it is quite constrained um, so I think the government's listened to the House of Lords Constitution Committee well, and I think well, it the House of Lords it, Committee says it, it wasn't well, well they the haven't report, listened. Well, and Hang I've on, read... Mark Harper, I've got what they've said here. Um, and the Constitutional Committee, so said David Davis, said this is the way it has to be done, in the way you've mm. described, you have to have secondary uh, legislation. Mm. The House of Lords Constitution Committee report today says it is a source of considerable regret that the bill is drafted in a way that renders scrutiny very difficult and that multiple and fundamental constitutional questions are left unanswered. So I'm not sure the House of Lords Constitution Committee is signed up to the way government is going to actually implement this bill. No, it, it said, look, it said it wasn't ideal, but it also mm. said it was the well, only practical way It says a bit more than it. it wasn't if ideal. If you're going to have to put 12,000 pieces of legislation into British law so that there's certainty and clarity for business and individuals, there is no other practical way of doing it. And ministers have been very clear that this is about copying the legislation across, making D small changes if you require it on the detail. They've made it very clear that if you're actually changing the policy intention, there'll be primary legislation that will go through the full parliamentary scrutiny right. process. And the that's why people shouldn't be concerned. The important point, Jenny Chapman, is the time frame, isn't it? The clock is ticking. Sure. And to actually mm. do this bill and go through every single piece of legislation and do it via Parliament so that they would have time to scrutinise it would take years. And yes. we wouldn't meet the time frame. That's true. But on time, if I could just make the point, first of all, that we are 15 months since the vote to leave and the government has been quite blasé about taking time out in that we had the delay for the court case, they then had another... Presumably you wanted that court the, case, uh, didn't you? Well, that wasn't really the government's choice. No, and they, and also they, they chose to fight yeah. it, which took many months more. They also had a general election, which I think they probably now regret. Well, and, and all she of this, did say, Theresa May, she wouldn't call it. All of this has delayed progress. Our objection with this bill, I mean, we look very carefully at the House of Lords report, and it's very, very clear, and Anne Taylor, the chair, has been very, very clear, that if this were just a case of allowing ministers to implement technical changes, we wouldn't be having this discussion. And what we want to see is a removal of the ability of ministers to make decisions by diktat on primary legislation. So it will take years, basically. It so so need to, to, take to, years. to do it what you need, are suggesting why will it take, take longer years? than two years. It doesn't need to. It doesn't need to. Parliament needs to do its job. 
we're prepared to devote the time that's needed. The government doesn't have a full agenda Joe, at the moment. Joe, the Parliament is not overwhelmed in legislation I, I right do, now, I, and we would devote as much time but, but as but was Joe, needed to this. I did the maths this. on this right. If Parliament sat 365 days a year, uh, it would take... Uh, you'd, be able, you'd have to go through 33 pieces of legislation a day uh, over that period. Right, but Jenny which means you, you don't have to do everything. Which means you wouldn't be no. scrutinising it very well. I mean, this is just... Uh, we'd be doing a lot better job than we're going to be. Delaying tactics because there are a lot of people that don't actually want us to leave, or they don't want this to be done in a sensible, careful way. And, and is Dominic Grieve, the to... former Attorney General, your your colleague, one of those when he says this bill seeks to confer powers on the government to carry out Brexit in breach of our constitutional principles in a manner that no sovereign parliament would allow? Is he one of those that is seeking well, to frustrate and delay I, the process? I don't agree with the analysis that he set out. I've looked at the bill carefully and I did that in you know before we start debating it in parliament uh, and I don't think it does. It's very clear the powers that are going to ministers are constrained. Um, they're all ultimately um, reviewable uh, in the courts so ministers will have that in mind That'll when they're making delay. decisions. <laughs> but I think if you're going to get the legislation on the statute book so that we get a smooth exit and certainty for people and I think this is the sensible practical way right, well, of let's doing put it. Right, well let's put the, the scenario to you Jenny Chapman that let's say you were able to scrutinise or mm. you were able to take more time over individual pieces of legislation and you hit the deadline of March 2019. What would happen to the country then when all those laws were not on our statute book. No, we agree that there needs to be a mechanism to align our laws. We absolutely agree right. with that. We're not saying... In that time frame. We said in our manifesto that the way the government is going about this and this particular bill was wrong and that we would oppose it and we would introduce a different way of going about it. The government doesn't what have is to that do it. What is that different way of going about it? Because by opposing Parliament. An opposition opposes yes. um, and it's taken Labour a very long time, it seems, to get to this position, both on the single market and the customs union during the transition period and decide to oppose during the passage of this bill. What would you do if you were in government? But we, that's not correct, actually. I mean, we said when this bill was first published that we set out our reasons for opposing it. We wrote to David Davis saying what they were. We said that if he could provide a bit of movement on this, that we wouldn't be opposing and it. What, so but what is this bit of be, movement? We, well, we want Parliament to be properly involved. We don't like it How? that what the government's going to do on Tuesday is it's going to set up committees that are going to be looking at delegated legislation committees, SIs, that will be looking at these um, instruments through the bill. The government has no majority in Parliament, but it is attempting to make sure that it has a Conservative majority on every single one of these committees. Now, that is not right oh. that the government should have the power to make decisions on things like workers' rights, holiday pay for my constituents, in the committee room with a majority that it does not enjoy so in what, Parliament. And I come back to my first question, why should we trust you on that basis? Well, first of all, Jenny's just uh, admitted that Parliament will actually be scrutinising these pieces. No, yeah, but with a majority of yeah, Tory members. And, <laughs> and, that's different. And that's, and that's how Parliament normally proceeds. But we've been very clear, if you're going to transfer this volume of legislation to have the certainty, which you need to do, then you need to do it in this way. If the Labour Party thinks that the bill should be changed in some way, then it's open to the Labour Party to do that at the committee stage. Which we will. If they're, <laughs> but if they're actually opposing the bill in principle, if you don't have this bill... Which is what I asked the, which brings the law into into British law. You are basically saying that we're going to leave the European Union in a chaotic position well, without all of that legislation. They're not saying that, are they? The they are making a stand yes, against it on, the on the Monday. Different. I they understand. The bill, but let's and they should deal well, with let's the have detail. What we decide to do, and they should Mark, deal with, with the all respect. Yes, you know, I mean are, they, they are the opposition. Um, <laughs> can I just, Mark? You say there is going to be scrutiny, but why only eight days in committee stage? That is not very long. Well, it, it's actually a fair, but we've got two days to debate the second reading of the bill, the mm. principle of it. Eight days on the floor of the House of Commons is actually quite a long period How of long time. How long did the Maastricht it's bill not, have in terms of committee it's stage? Not a, 23 days. Yes, but it's not... The European Communities Act, uh, back in 1972, had 22 yes, days. But remember what this bill is doing. It's literally taking mm. the existing legislation and translating it into Adopting, British law. Yes. It isn't making big policy changes or handing powers... But it gives powers, you the power to make those policy changes. That's to the another point. Parliament overseas, what? as the Maastricht Bill did for Right. Example. Well, let, Jenny, you say that it does give them the, mm. the possibility. I mean, powers. in what policy area has the government indicated it is going to make those big policy er uh, changes? We believe that they would, given the chance, make changes to 
issues such as workers' rights, environmental protections, consumer protections. We're very concerned about it. They've indicated previously, cabinet members have indicated previously that that would be their intention. So it is too much to ask the British people to take on trust that a government minister, given that power now, unaccountably and free of scrutiny, would resist the urge to make those changes. Are you going to, would you support a government that tries to lessen and weaken workers' rights? No, the Prime Minister has been very clear that we're going to do no such thing. This bill is about getting all this legislation into British law as it is. Right, but hang on, when, the, the important question, done... let's, let's, let's concentrate on the substance, because yeah, yeah. we've done the practicalities. Yeah, yeah. The issue is there could be a situation where important protections to Jenny Chapman and her party and her supporters come into play. And you would have the potential power, I'm not saying you would necessarily exercise it, but you would have the potential power to change those protections, we, weaken them in the eyes of the opposition, and they wouldn't be able to do anything about we've it. We've been very clear that if we, if we want to change any substantial issues, that will be done through primary legislation brought that in a bill, the bill allows. before Parliament. The bill allows that to happen very clear through a that. process which has only ever been defeated. I think the last time it was defeated um, in Parliament was 38 years ago. This is the wrong way to go about it, and it's anti-democratic. Right, well, we can see um, pictures now um, on the screen from inside the Commons, and the debate has started. Um, the start of what is a significant moment in the passage of this Brexit bill, even if the government doesn't lose the vote, despite the opposition uh, voting against it on Monday, there will be an awful lot of wrangling through the committee stages when amendments could be put down uh, by opponents to the bill, both within the Tory party and the opposition. Um, Jenny Chapman, amendments. Mm. Have you got a raft of amendments ready to go for the committee we, stage? We will have amendments. I'm not going to tell you what they're going to be. But Why I, not? Because we... Uh, we you haven't written them. We've got to wait till Monday. Um, but, you know, we will have amendments, as will backbench members, as will other opposition parties. And I think that you will see Parliament assert itself over this process, even if we don't win the vote on Monday. Parliament isn't going to sit back and let this go through without challenge. Right. As an observer, listening to <laughs> this debate at the start of this process and this particular uh, piece of legislation, and it is an important uh, moment because it is going to unpick the European Communities Act uh, that was set up with all those laws. What's your view? Well, I worry about the internal strife, you know, it's much easier to sort out uh, issues at school between children. So I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And People would hands. say there's similarities you know. sometimes um, <laughs> dealing with these. So, yeah, and I worry simply because I feel this is the time for the country to, you know, bind together mm. because we've got to sort out this big thing with the EU. And, you know, we, we normal, ordinary people uh, look to you to, to, mm. to solve it all. So you all need to be friends and, um, uh. and and then that way you can you can sort things out. No pressure. <laughs> no. Now, you two are staying with us for a little bit longer and we're going to stick with the Brexit theme. In Brussels this morning, the EU mm -hmm. have published some of their position papers. You may remember the UK published a whole series of scintillating position papers. And we've learnt that the European Union wants Northern Ireland to have a different Brexit deal from the rest of the UK. And they want the UK to take responsibility for finding a unique solution so people can work, go to school or get medical treatment either side of the border. Let's hear what Michel Barnier, the chief Brexit negotiator for the EU, has had to say just before we came on air. The solution for the border issue will need to be unique. It cannot pre-configure the future relationship between the European Union and the UK. It will require both sides to be flexible and creative. And what I see in the UK's paper on Ireland and Northern Ireland worries me. The UK wants the EU to suspend the application of its laws, its customs union and its single market as what will be a new external border for the EU. And the UK wants to use Ireland as a kind of test case for the future EU-UK custom relations. This will not happen. Michel Barnier, though, well, we've also heard this morning that the European Commission 
has been critical of David Davis, the Brexit secretary, and suggested he displayed a lack of involvement, which risked jeopardising the success of the negotiations after meeting him in July. Well, let's speak now to our old friend, less of the old perhaps, Adam Fleming, who's in Brussels. Adam, tell us then first of all about the minutes that have been published um, displaying some degree of concern from the EU Commission about David Davis's behaviour. Right, Joe, I've got two massive piles of paper in front of me. And we'll talk you. about this pile first. So, yeah, these are minutes of a meeting that were published. Um, the minutes were published yesterday, last night, but the meeting happened on the 12th of July. It was between Jean-Claude Juncker and all the other European commissioners in that building there and Michel Barnier, the chief negotiator. And they were talking about progress in the first round of Brexit talks, which had happened in June. So it's, it's kind of a bit old, but the stuff that, that Jean-Claude Juncker and Michel Barnier says is quite striking. So what uh, President Juncker says, he expressed his concern, according to the minutes, about the question of the stability and accountability of the UK negotiator, David Davis, and his apparent lack of involvement in the process, which risked jeopardising the success of the negotiations. And that is something that was repeated by Michel Barnier earlier on in the discussion. So I imagine some people think that's slightly undiplomatic language that, uh, that the EU side had been using about David Davis there. Um, the spokeswoman for the Commission, who's speaking a little while earlier, said that things had moved on since July and that if we wanted a real picture of how things are going, we should look forward to sets of minutes that are released in the future that are relevant to more recent meetings of the European Commission. And Michel Barnier in his press conference was asked about this and he said, look, I stood next to David Davis on the same stage at the same podium and paid tribute to how hard he's been working. So I think the European Commission trying very, very hard to put this document behind them. Right, OK. So his homework's improved, it seems, David Davis, as far as the Commission is concerned. What about these position papers and particularly the one regarding the border between Northern Ireland and Ireland? So that's this other pile of papers here, the position papers, all sorts of stuff on public procurement, intellectual property, data, stuff like that. But you're right that the, the one that's got a lot of attention is the EU's paper of its guiding principles for its dialogue with the UK over what to do about the Irish border. Uh, in summary, it says to the UK, you're responsible for coming up with solutions to this because you're the country that's leaving the EU. What they propose is that there will be a unique solution that is unique for Northern Ireland and, in their words, does not pre-configure the solution for the rest of the UK. In other words, Northern Ireland, because it's a special case, will get a special deal that will not be replicated for the rest of the UK in the rest of the final Brexit withdrawal agreement done with the EU. There's also going to be exceptions, potentially, written into that withdrawal agreement uh, to allow what's called cross-border cooperation. In other words, that's written into the Good Friday Agreement where North and South collaborate on things like tourism, social security, health, fisheries, transport and energy. In other words, day-to-day -day life in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland will carry on as normal. That's at least what they want to do in the Brexit agreement. So that's another case of where Northern Ireland will be an exception to what happens to the rest of the UK. But it was really interesting just listening to Michel Barney in his press conference there because he said it himself, he is worried about what the UK has proposed in this. He's worried that what the UK is proposing about it, uh, uh, an invisible border, means that actually it will jeopardise Ireland's place in the single market and also that the UK might be using it almost as a sort of Trojan horse, not his words, as a test case for the rest of the Brexit deal for the rest of the UK. And Michel Barnier says that will not wash. But there is one big area of agreement between both sides where they're actually quite proud of this, and that's maintaining what's called the common travel area. That's basically the free movement of people, of British and Irish people, between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland and the UK. Both sides have worked very, very hard to come up with an agreement that that will be maintained, and the British side feel that that will help to unlock a lot of the other issues that Michel Barnier has been talking about. Wow. I'm sorry it's so complicated, but it's no. a really big deal. And all I can say is you're certainly not disengaged uh, from the uh, process. David Davis could learn a lot, clearly, from you. Enjoy the rest of those papers. Um, Mark Harper, are both the Commission and the UK government just publishing these endless position papers? I think there were nine mm -hmm. uh, from the UK government. We've had a series from the Commission just to show that they're doing something.
No, I mean, they're part of the dialogue. I mean, Michel Barnier there said that he wanted the British government to come up with some potential solutions for the uh, Ireland, Northern Ireland border. And indeed, we published a couple of suggestions in our position paper on Northern Ireland. We mm. confirmed that we want the Good Friday Agreement to be in, embedded in the withdrawal but agreement. But no saying it wouldn't be. I mean, I read that uh, yeah, yeah. position paper, and there's nothing in there um, that anybody would intrinsically well, disagree well, with. It's just that it doesn't the... actually come... And also, there's well, been the an admission... Stuff, uh, well, Michel hang on, was but there's, well, well, he is, so... but the, now. But there was an admission also mm. after that position mm. paper that the technological... Mm. Um, solution that the UK government hoped would be put in place is just not mm. going to work. So, you know, there still isn't any progress mm. on what will happen to customs, which is really what we're talking about, and trade across the board. No, well, part of how this works is we put forward some proposals and the Commission will then respond to them and then there'll be a, some toing and froing. So, I mean, I think there's a clear agreement that Northern Ireland is, that relationship's very, very important because it's the only external border. There's a clear commitment on both sides to make that work, and I think it's now a lot of detail needs to be done to, to get to a final, a final agreement. Doesn't it show, though, Jenny Chapman, that actually this idea of sequencing the mm. negotiations is not really working? Because you can't really discuss the future and the status of that Irish border without including what will be the ultimate free trade deal trade, yeah. and Correct. the customs. I mean, isn't that the case? I mean, you're right. It is incredibly difficult. But mm. don't forget that the phasing of this doesn't require completion of an agreement or things to be completely resolved. Sure. It requires significant progress. Mm. And I think, you know, I have some sympathy for David Davis on the issue of Northern Ireland in that to expect it to be resolved within the next couple of months is just not realistic. And I think what I'm seeing is a huge amount of political will, actually, mm. from Europe and from the UK government and from the Irish government to find a solution. It is not going to be easy and it probably will not be resolved until, as you say, we get a clearer idea of what the future relationship on trade is going to be. Let's talk about Labour's position regarding mm. the single market um, and the customs union because it's now the policy, um, having gone through various m uh, metamorphoses, that <laughs> you're going to stay in the single market, would like to stay in the single market and the customs union through the transition, transition period. Yeah. But your deputy leader, Tom Watson, has suggested that that could be a permanent state for the single market. And today, Keir Starmer, the Brexit shadow Brexit secretary, has said remaining in the customs union could also, he said, permanently no, a be a, vi <laughs> a customs union, be a viable option. A so customs union. It's a very, very important case? distinction. Right. But uh, is what? that the case now, that you are actually going to be the party of free movement and submission no. to the European Court of Justice? No. What we've said... I mean, our position is very clear, but what it's not is always the most simple, and I accept that. Mm -hmm. But what it is, is that we would like to stay in a transitional arrangement for around two years, we think is realistic, mm -hmm. and that would involve us remaining part of the single market and the customs union, but it's time-limited, and it's only as a transitional period. Right, so Tom Watson and, was wrong to suggest and, it could be permanent for the I single don't market. I mean, I, I don't think he said exactly that. He I, did, actually, I on think, Newsnight. Uh, but what we're also clear about is, I mean, I saw that on Newsnight. He was answering about three questions in one breath. I think it was quite so, clear he said it could be a permanent state. It could be, but that's not our policy. And it is a customs union. We do need to have a customs relationship with the rest of Europe where we don't have encumbrance and tariffs and friction at our borders. Everybody wants that. Even David Davis says that he wants that. So that's not a, a particularly radical thing to say. But our position... And in fact, it might be the same, a customs union, as what the government is, is suggesting or looking at. Well, let's see. But we want this... What we want, and we're very clear about it, is we want this transitional deal, because without that, you do have a cliff edge. And I know that there are some people on the Tory backbenches who are quite relaxed about that, but we're not, and neither is business. And I think, you know, the government needs to... And the government's actually hinting. David Davis this morning in Brexit Questions was hinting that he's softening on this argument. And, you know, he wasn't too far away from saying that he agreed with us on this. Right. Do you agree with Jenny on that? Well, we've been very clear we want a, an implementation period, that you need to have that smooth transition. Except, but, but interestingly... Except you're, coming that, out, but you're going to be coming out of the single market. Well, yes, but, the you need, but you need a, a period that you're going to implement the, the arrangement yeah. that we reach for afterwards. But you out can't of the single that, market you can't and out of the overnight. customs union, yes, so we, there will be a cliffhanger. Yes, we've been very clear. If you, stay in the customs, if you stay in the single market, you submit to free movement, the Court of Justice, and the whole point about the referendum was that voters decided that they didn't want to submit to those things. Right. But We've been clear that you can't go from being in the European Union to the final position and that final deal 
overnight. You've got to implement it over a period of time. In terms of the Prime Minister is very clear it's, about that. Government is shifting because it's realising that it has to, because it would just be crippling for British industry to do anything other than have an, inter, an interim arrangement, a transitional period. And on freedom of movement, just to allow me to say this, you know, the Labour Party fully accepts that freedom of movement is ending and we need a new immigration system When's after we leave. It will need to end after we leave the European Union, in and after, March we've, 2019. after we've completed our transitional right. period. So because later. clearly, you, if you're going to yes, be in a single market, you have to have freedom, you of, have movement. freedom of movement. But that is a time-limited interim step because of the lack of progress there's been by the government on achieving anything else. All right, on that point, I'm going to say thank you both very much. Thank you. On a day that splits over Brexit hit the Commons and the government faces an uphill battle to pass key legislation on Britain leaving the European Union. A two-day debate of the key EU withdrawal bill begins today, but Labour plans to vote against it, and even some Conservative MPs say the legislation would amount to an executive power grab. The Brexit battles have already started this morning. David Davis, the Brexit Secretary, has been answering MPs' questions about the UK's departure from the EU. The Secretary of State set out his position on the EEA. On the 15th of August, um, the Secretary of State told the Today programme that transition arrangements should be, and I quote, as close as possible to the current arrangements. Two days before that, the Chancellor and the International Trade Secretary said in a joint article that Britain would leave the customs union and leave the single market. Both positions can't be right. Can you step up to the dispatch box and tell us what, the, what form of transitional arrangements the government is seeking to negotiate? It's very well, clear. More... Uh, the, the, the transition arrangements, the transition arrangements, the transition arrangements will meet the requirements, three different requirements. One is to provide time for the British government, if need be, to create new regulatory agencies and so on the uh, time for companies to make their arrangements to deal with new regulation and time for foreign countries, for other countries, to make arrangements on, for example, customs, new customs uh, proposals. Now, that's what will be required. That's why we need to be as close as we are to our current arrangements. It does not mean that in the long run we in either the customs union or the single market. Well, with more details about uh, the historic debates uh, still to come, I'm joined uh, by, uh, by Fazl Islam, uh, our political editor. Uh, Fazl, I mean, you know, everyone knows this is complicated, everyone knows it's confused. Can we even see a pattern now as to where the government is heading? I'm seeing a bit of a pattern. I think right now we're facing about 10 weeks of crunch time where the number 10 have been involved not just in one negotiation that we focus on with Michel Barnier with Brussels. You've got a negotiation with Parliament over these powers. On the one hand, I think Parliament feels that there is a, a necessity to have some degree of executive clean-up power. We've had 40-odd years uh, uh, connected with the EU. But they don't want that to turn into uh, making new laws. Well, or just consider this. One MP said to me, well, hang on a minute. If you give these powers to number 10, you can't control who has them. And they are widespread. Someone even suggested that you could join the euro on the basis of these powers because they, they assume the powers of an act of parliament. So you could bypass uh, uh, the commons. Now, people don't really suggest that that's the plan of David Davis or Theresa May. Once it's on the statute book, this is what one Tory MP said to me, uh, what if there's an election? Jeremy Corbyn has now got access to these powers. There's also a really intriguing and very techy thing about a money bill that's going through on Monday, which could give uh, the power to the government not to have to come back to Parliament to approve a figure for uh, the so-called financial settlement, divorce bill, whatever you want to call it. So there's all sorts of parliamentary procedure. And the general principle with Parliament is, well, hang on, we wanted to take back control. Uh, the uh, people of Britain, or 52%, voted to take back control to Parliament. This was not then to pass on those powers to number 10. Now, what the government is saying is, hang on a minute, uh, if you want stable and smooth Brexit and you don't want chaos, you've got to vote for this bill. And then, uh, and that undermines what the opposition is saying, or they say it undermines what the opposition is saying about, you know, the chaos of a WTO terms Brexit. So you have the negotiation with Barnier, you have the negotiation with Parliament, you have the negotiation with Cabinet, which I think was probably what we saw in that leak in terms of the Home Office paper, an early paper. 
that again is an example of how complicated things are because on the one hand it was sold as kind of hardline crackdown on immigration from the EU but what I discerned from it was that it all said in every other paragraph we could have a bespoke arrangement for EU migrants what does that mean does it mean we could have yes not EU law mandated freedom of movement but could we negotiate some special access to EU citizens as part of the final deal uh, perhaps freedom of movement for workers uh, under UK law would that be sufficient to assuage the fears of referendum voters I don't know but I see that that option is left in that paper and that was a very early draft of that paper and the final negotiation which we should not underestimate is with business and Mark Kleiman uh, broke, that did, story, broke that story last night about this letter standard issue for Conservative governments to get business leaders FTSE 100 chiefs to sign up to their economic plans uh, uh, but this is clearly a more complicated area. Uh, they ha haven't been as forthcoming as they would have been for, a, for David Cameron's plans in the past. But I think the bigger point here is number 10 thought that this was a good idea. Well, it's pretty clear that FTSE bosses are, con some of them are concerned about the customs union single market. If we get in one further negotiation, what about the Labour Party, though? Beca oh, yeah. Because here they are, they say they've accepted the will of the people, they voted for the triggering of Article 50. This is the EU withdrawal bill, and now they're saying they're going to vote against it. Isn't that defying the will of the people? So uh, their argument would be, well, there's an argument and a judgment. Their argument is about the centralisation of powers, and that's something that Jeremy Corbyn, throughout his history in Parliament, has, has appealed to him, the idea of the executive being overbearing. You know, even when his, yeah. Tony Blair was Prime Minister, when Mark Thatcher was Prime Minister, he was uh, involved in those types of debates. He likes that argument. He can bite that argument. It's how Keir Starmer, I think, sold the new position uh, of opposing this to uh, Jeremy Corbyn. But clearly there are some Labour leavers uh, who uh, aren't going to vote with the front bench. We'll see how, what numbers they are. Uh, we'll see also what, uh, if there are any abstentions. Uh, but I think there's also a judgment. And the judgment is that the election has changed the game. Whereas the election was perceived to be about the problems with uh, freedom of movement uh, and reconciling that in Labour's heartlands, they now say, well, we've had the election. We lost five seats. Uh, Labour leavers had the opportunity to vote for Theresa May's Brexit. And it turns out that they value their Labour affiliation more than their leave vote. So there's a political judgment, a cephalogical judgment been made, and indeed Labour won Remain voters from the Conservatives, from the Lib Dems, and consolidated the left. So the net transfer from Brexit for Labour was up because Remainers seem to care more uh, about their vote than Leavers. That's their judgment. Now, they might be wrong if they push that too far, and that's obviously the political game that the government, the government wants to sow the seeds that Labour are betraying the leave votes uh, in today's debate. So very interesting currents and cross-currents today and for the next few weeks, frankly. Well, the next few months, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Fascinating, fascinating <laughs> stuff. Thank you. Well, of course, uh, whatever Bre the Brexit deal Britain gets uh, isn't just dependent on debates in Parliament. The European Union is publishing position papers on key issues. And in one of those leaked documents, the EU says that it's Britain's responsibility to deal with the questions about the Irish border after Brexit. Well, let's get the view from Europe of the Labour MEP, Richard Corbett. Thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us. I mean, what is going on? We've got Britain laying out its position papers. Now we've got the EU publishing position papers telling us what we've got to do. Is that really appropriate? Well, the EU has published in, uh, ahead of the UK very often its position papers on all the issues that are coming up, and it's, it's doing so again. And here, what it's, what it's doing is actually gently reminding Britain that it was, it's Britain that has notified the EU of its intention to leave. It's not the EU that has asked Britain to leave. But as Britain has realised that leaving without a deal that preserves some aspects of the benefits of membership, that it makes particular arrangements about this or that, without a deal, we're in deep trouble. It's up to the UK to say what it wants and to put proposals on the table. The onus is on Britain. And is there, in what is being proposed about the Irish border, uh, an element of uh, the European Union saying, look, we do have skin in this game, Ireland is our member, and we've got to look after our members' interests? Yes, if Britain leaves the customs union, if we go ahead with Brexit, and if we go ahead with leaving the customs union as well, then unavoidably the Irish border becomes a customs border. It will be the external customs border of the European Union's customs union. 
how on earth to deal with that without creating barriers, without creating red tape, without creating economic disruption on the whole of the island of Ireland, including Northern Ireland. That's a pretty big problem. But, but it it's is, one by uh, Britain. Britain but it, but, well, I, I understand it's a problem, but at the same time, if the UK, including Northern Ireland, leaves the European Union, if there are consequences for the border because there are different regulations on either side of the border, it's not really for the EU to say it's unacceptable uh, for Britain to uh, make sure that there's a border there, is it? Because we become two separate entities. If there's a border, one side can't say, well, we're just going to uh, demand that you abolish that border. No, there, there will have to be an agreement, but the EU is saying in the first instance it, it's Britain that has to make proposals because how that works depends on Britain's choices. If Britain goes ahead and leaves the European Union but stays in the customs union or not, stays in the single market or not, those are British decisions. So it will be up to the UK to say in this eventuality, this is how we would propose to deal with the problem of the Northern Ireland border. But, I mean, you know, take another issue, that wanting special protection so that can't have imitations of parma ham or feta cheese or, or, or carva. I mean, the whole point is we're separating. So, you know, why should we have protections uh, for uh, these uh, food products uh, when presumably uh, they might give us not give protection for Cornish cotton cream or something like that within the EU? Well, such uh, protections are quite common in trade deals and they work both ways around because it's exactly the same European legislation that protect, protects Wensleydale cheese, Cornish cotton uh, that you just referred to, um, Yorkshire forced rhubarb from imitation elsewhere. It works both ways and unless this issue is addressed, it's one of many little detailed issues that nobody told us about at the time of the referendum, but they will need to be sorted and settled by the time of British exit from the European Union, assuming we go ahead with it. And are these matters, do you think, from the EU27's point of view, are they deal breakers? In other words, if they don't get what they want on Palmer Ham or on the Irish border, then there won't be a deal, it'll be hard Brexit. Is that, is that how it now looks? Well, that's difficult to say because there's such a, a long set of issues and if there's only one or two where there's no deal, would that upset the whole deal? Who knows? It depends how strongly people feel about it. But don't underestimate political pressures within different EU countries. We've, we've been talking a lot about the political debates and divisions and sometimes confusion within Britain. Uh, but imagine if you're a producer of, say, Parma ham, in Italy and you've not got that protection, you will probably be putting pressure on the Italian government to be firm. I expect that's true for other products across Europe as well. And maybe conversely in Britain, that producers of our protected products from Wensleydale cheese to whatever it is, will want that to be in the deal as well. And you can list hundreds of different, very different issues where there will be pressures like that on both sides of the negotiations. And I noticed that, that you did use if Britain leaves the European Union, uh, seeing it as a hypothetical. I mean, do you think it is a hypothetical or that it might not happen? Well, all I'm saying is that is remind is to point out that until it actually happens, Britain can change its mind if it wants to. That's a British decision. And you, do you think that's a, a realistic possibility? Well, who knows? I mean, I, I see that chaos and confusion surrounds this whole process, and where, and. If you think about it from the point of view of somebody who voted to leave, very few Leave voters voted for Brexit at any cost. They were told it won't cost money, it will save money and it can all go to the NHS. Now that it's becoming increasingly apparent that this will be a costly exercise for our economy, a damaging exercise, those voters are entitled to say, hang on a minute, that's not what I was told, that's not what I voted for. So. Who knows, there may be a reconsideration. Once we see that final deal, the divorce agreement, when it comes back for a meaningful vote in the British Parliament, um, the British Parliament is entitled, should it so wish, to say, now we see what this really means, rather than the nice stories told at the time of the referendum. Now we see what it actually entails. 
maybe we should step back from the brink. OK, Richard Corbett, thank you very much indeed from uh, that view from the European Parliament. What about here in the UK, where MPs later today are debating the government's EU withdrawal bill, uh, transferring or attempting to transfer EU laws to UK law? Joining me now is Pat McFadden, a Labour MP, former Shadow a Europe Minister. Just on, on that last point there from uh, Richard Corbett, I mean, do you, do you think there is still a possibility it won't happen? Well, I don't detect a huge change in public opinion from the referendum last year so far. I think people uh, probably haven't moved very much. Uh, but where I think Richard Corbett's right is, I think people have got a right to change their mind if they want to. I'm not saying they will. I don't think they have so far. But I think they've got a right to do so uh, as this process unfolds and develops. Because one thing that's true is we were told this would all be easy. In fact, there was some comment about you could sort all this out in an afternoon and it's the discussion you've just had with Richard Corbett mm -hmm. about Parma ham and Wensleydale cheese and you know a hundred other things uh, shows this is a hugely complex negotiation the government now uh, realize that so let's see how they mm -hmm. get on with the negotiation that they've begun on this particular issue of the EU withdrawal bill I mean the government has got to be given some executive power to deal with this I mean just just the practicalities of translating 12,000 laws, hasn't it? Well, there's a big irony, isn't there? We were told last year at the referendum that the purpose of Brexit was to take back control, that instead of having laws made either by the European Council or the European Parliament, it would be our sovereign parliament that would be making the laws. And what we have here is a huge constitutional change, a huge power grab, not from uh, the Westminster Parliament, but away from the Westminster Parliament, and in the hands of ministers. And that's not just my view. If you take Dominic Grieve, an eminent Conservative, former Attorney General, he wrote last night that this meant that our domestic constitution and liberties would be vandalised. So this isn't just a, a Labour view on this. This goes across the parties that what you have here isn't Westminster Parliament taking control, mm. but actually ministers taking no. control from our But parliament. in practical terms, what's the alternative? Because, I mean, you can't have... You know, if you've had an hour's debate on 12,000 laws each, I mean, that would take up an entire year of parliamentary business. Well, I'd be tempted to say I didn't start this process, no, so no, that's no, what no, I'm saying. No, no, no. But, uh, if but you're, I mean, you accept, though, if you, you're going you, to, you accept the will of the people was expressed in terms of leading sure, the European yes, Union. Yes, yes. This is now how do you, the professional but politicians, if you, do if it. If you're going to do things through statutory instruments, you've got to have proper parliamentary safeguards. So there's none of those really built into the bill. And uh, to give you a serious answer, I think during the debate, uh, both in the second reading today and Monday, and in committee stage, there'll be a lot of amendments and a lot of focus on how you strengthen Parliament's role if you're going to have to make some changes through the kind of process that you're uh, talking about. Look, in one way, this is all very technical for the public. What's, you know, this Henry VIII secondary mm -hmm. legislation, what's this all about? What it's really about at the end of the day is in this process of deciding our future mm. laws, who's really uh, going to make the decisions? Is it our parliament or is it ministers without much reference uh, to parliament? Why do we need to do it at all? I mean, why don't we just say, OK, those were European laws, we're not obeying them anymore? Well, the, the government could uh, do that, but they've said that that's impossible because it would leave huge holes in our statute book. They've also said they want to avoid a cliff edge for the UK mm economy. What we're doing here is unpicking 40 odd years of economic wiring uh, in terms of single market, customs unions, all these, all these uh, institutions uh, and rules that we've been part of. Uh, if you just ripped it all up uh, in the way that you've just suggested, that would be huge dislocation for the economy and the rules of trade and the basis upon which many people have invested in our economy from Japanese car companies to uh, banks from overseas and inward investors from all around the world. So you need to have a system here that gives people some degree of certainty and continuity going forward. And by the way, that's becoming more urgent by the day. We don't have two years to do that. We've got to sort this out a lot sooner than that. Yeah, it's, I agree it's not what they were promised during the referendum campaign, but there's some evidence from polls now that a lot of people are saying, we want to leave the European Union even if it costs us economically? Well, I think this is a really interesting question, is uh, 
the price to be paid for this. Uh, you know, we were told there wouldn't be a price, that there'd be this £350 million that we would have extra to spend. It doesn't look like that at the moment. It looks like there's going to be... Still people some saying the economy's on, doing pretty well. On, ongoing bill. Well, our, our growth relative to the Eurozone is a lot worse than it was a year or two ago. But, uh, I mean, I think you've raised an interesting question is uh, what price... Uh, uh, is the country prepared to pay for this? That's not been made clear at the moment. The main economic effect so far has been the decline in value of the pound. That's beginning to feed through into higher prices uh, for people. I mean, I represent a low-income uh, constituency where many people struggle to make ends meet. And what I don't want to see is my constituents uh, forced to stretch thin budgets ever further. But a lot of them voted to leave. A lot of them they? voted to leave, but these consequences have not really fed through yet. So I think polls one thing. Let's see how people feel as this rolls out. Pat McFadden, thank you very much indeed. Well, returning to uh, Parliament's main business today of Brexit, this morning David Davis uh, said that there is a good prospect of agreeing a transition deal with the European Union. Uh, and, of course, the EU withdrawal bill is being debated this afternoon. Well, joining me now is the Labour MP Chris Leslie, who will be speaking today for Open Britain, which uh, campaigns for a soft Brexit. And, uh, Ms Leslie, I mean, a lot of talk in this country about this transition deal, mm -hmm. yet when it was raised with David Davis, he said, well, certainly not mm -hmm. uh, equivalent to Norway, which yeah. seems to be what the European Union are talking about. So, so is the transition deal even a reality at this point? Well, stage? that's what I'm beginning to worry, because you would have thought that, OK, if the government's objectives was now to seek a sort of uh, more gradual exit rather than this fabled cliff edge that people are worried about, you would probably step away from the EU into something like the Norway arrangement. Um, the the uh, European Free Trade Association, EFTA, is one such option. The EEA is part of that, the European Economic Area as well. Now, of course, the bill going through today repeals Britain's involvement in the EEA, but there was still some suggestion, well, maybe that would be a sort of stepping stone. David Davis today ruling it out. And I kind of am slightly staggered by this. Why you know, voluntarily narrow our options for a transition arrangement and, in a way, step closer and closer towards that hard Brexit cliff edge when he didn't really need to do that? And I think... It start, alarm bells are, are starting to ring. It's why the currency has been, you know, hit so far. Sterling is very, very weak. I think 168-year low, not since, I think, before Big Ben was even constructed. Did we Have we had such a weak uh, currency position? And that's because the markets, businesses are starting to think, hold on a minute, we're not going to get this softer transition. And David Davis is compounding that today by saying no to EFTA, no to the EEA. That's the worry I think that I certainly have. And of course, the, the counter to that is that leaving the European Union, even in the transition phase, wouldn't be acceptable to uh, the majority who voted for it if it means continuing large payments to the European Union uh, and if it means a continuing subjection to European Court of Justice law. Well, I think most people are now waking up and realising that actually we're going to be making a very large payment anyway because it looks as though there are various liabilities that Britain uh, is going to have to uh, pay up to if we're going to keep those trading relationships that we have. And if we do trade, certainly if we as a service sector based economy, 80% of our business is service sector, if we want to still sell services into Europe, our biggest markets, then we will, be ha we will have to uh, have alignment of our regulations. That means we're going to have to share rules, share regulatory decision making with Europe come what may. That's the reality. This idea that we can sort of pull up the drawbridge, have fortress Britain without any alliances is deeply dangerous, not just for the jobs and the mm. businesses that we got, but in terms of the income that we need for our treasury, for the public mm. services, for the schools and the hospitals. I tell you, everybody's going to be affected. I mean, Labour, Labour is torn on this, isn't it? Because many of the people who voted for Brexit, who perhaps do take a tough approach to what our future relationship should be to Europe, 
are Labour voters. Yeah, but I think Labour is, as Keir Starmer said, developing its position. It's coming on in a way I'm quite pleased with. I think we've still got to go further and realise that actually single market, customs union are actually the better places that we should try and preserve our involvement with. That wasn't on the ballot paper. People voted to leave the political institutions of the European Union, but our trading alliances, some of those relationships, those weren't on the ballot paper. And I don't believe that actually a majority of the public want to sort of scrap those in an act of self-harm. That is not, I think, in anybody's interest. And we've got to, I think, explain patiently uh, that, you know, there are consequences if we turn our backs to, to those massive markets. And what are your constituents saying to you? I think my constituents voted uh, uh, on balance to remain. That was the majority in, in Nottingham East. And I'm hearing more and more that they, in fact, are, are saying no Brexit might be better than a bad Brexit. That's the message that I'm getting through in my inbox. Uh, and I think for the public, if you know, they on reflection are starting to say, hold on a minute, this isn't that great for us overall. Well, we're Democrats. We shouldn't be ruling out any options. Chris Lesley, thank you very much indeed. And we're going now live to Brussels on the European Commission where uh, their chief Brexit negotiator, Michel Barnier, uh, is giving a news conference updating uh, the public. I attach great importance to the sincerity and quality of our dialogue with member states and the European Parliament, the member states on whose behalf I am negotiating. And these time that we spend together are of great importance to us. Otherwise, of course, I'm very well familiar with what tends to happen in the European Union as far as leaks are concerned. That is why, from the word go, I have made it very clear that I clearly wish to apply a policy of general transparency, subject to the reservation of what I said at the outset. And I would repeat... Uh, I certainly, by a long way, prefer transparency over leaks because that means that we, we are all on the same footing and you, in fact, are on the same footing. It's a level playing field amongst yourselves. The point of this uh, press conference. Today we published uh, our guiding principles for the dialogue on Ireland and Northern Ireland. We also published four papers on issues that will need to be part of the withdrawal agreement. Let me first focus on Ireland. The European Council and the European Parliament have recognized the unique situation and the specific circumstances of the island of Ireland. I see this specific situation as a special responsibility. First, the responsibility to preserve the peace process and the gains of the Good Friday Agreement in all its parts, in all its parts. Secondly, the responsibility to maintain the common travel area. And thirdly, the responsibility to avoid the return of a hard border between Ireland and Northern Ireland. We need first to agree on political principles. Discussing technical solutions will be premature in the political context of Northern Ireland. And we are working hand in hand with the Irish government. And I want to thank the Taoiseach, Leo Verdacar, and the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Simon Coveney, and their teams in Dublin and also in Brussels for their commitment. I also want to thank the other member states and the European Parliament for their full support. We have seen in these negotiations that Ireland's interest is the 27th interest and vice versa. The UK said that it is ready to ensure the common travel area can continue to operate while respecting Ireland's obligations as an EU member state, including 
in relation to free movement. On the Good Friday Agreement, the UK, as co guarantor will also need to put solutions forward. In particular, the interlocking political institutions created by the Good Friday Agreement will need to continue operating effectively. We need to avoid the return to our border between Ireland and Northern Ireland while respecting Ireland's place in the single market. North-South cooperation will need to be preserved in all, in all policy areas. Irish citizens residing in Northern Ireland must continue to enjoy their rights as EU citizens. It is the birth right of all the people of Northern Ireland to identify themselves and be accepted as Irish or British or both. And the European Union will honour its financial commitments in favour of programmes supporting the peace process, such as peace or interreg. We expect the UK to do the same as part of its financial settlement. But, ladies and gentlemen, we are not there yet. The solution for the border issue will need to be unique. It cannot pre-configure the future relationship between the European Union and the UK. It will require both sides to be flexible and creative. And what I see in the UK's paper on Ireland and Northern Ireland worries me. The UK wants the EU to suspend the application of its laws, its customs union, and its single market as what will be a new external border for the EU. And the UK wants to use Ireland as a kind of test case for the future EU-UK custom relations. This will not happen. Creativity and flexibility cannot be at the expense of the integrity of the single market and the custom union. This will be not fair for Ireland and this would not be fair for the European Union. Mesdames, Messieurs, Ladies and gentlemen, on Ireland, as on citizens' rights and on the financial settlement, we need sufficient progress to move forward. And in our paper today, if you read the text carefully on Ireland, you can see what our definition is of sufficient progress, what sort of political progress must be made so that on Ireland progress. Once that step has been taken on all the subjects, Ireland, the financial settlement and securing the rights of EU citizens and others, Sorry about, Sorry about that. Let's. It's the monthly drill. Well, it's encouraging to know it doesn't just happen here at Sky. Occasionally you get fire alarms which can interrupt broadcasting, and so it's come to pass. In Brussels, uh, Michel Barnier, the chief EU negotiator, uh, caught mid-sentence there, just as he was explaining that it was the UK's decision to leave the EU. It is the UK's responsibility to propose solutions. Here he is again. Yes, once this step has been taken, we, with the United Kingdom, shall draft the treaty organising this orderly withdrawal. This withdrawal under Article 50 must be precise. It will have to create legal certainty in all areas where Brexit has created and is creating uncertainty on the three priority subjects, but also on technical matters which negotiations will have to clarify in the months ahead. 
in order to achieve this legal certainty and precision, we are therefore publishing today four new position papers on intellectual property rights, customs, protection of data exchanged before withdrawal, and public procurement. So, in total, and I'm sure you've counted them, since June we have published 14 papers covering areas dealing with the orderly withdrawal of the United Kingdom. And I must say, from my point of view, it is very positive that the United Kingdom has published and in the days ahead will be publishing new position papers. Obviously, we will study those papers and positions very carefully, working immediately on everything which is part of orderly withdrawal and keeping for later what concerns the future relationship. The important thing for us is that these papers are sufficiently precise for us to make real progress. The sooner, ladies and gentlemen, we can see genuine, sufficient progress, the sooner we will start discussing in parallel a possible transition period, if the United Kingdom makes a request to that effect, and our future relationship, which, as you know, will require a second treaty. Through this second treaty, we too want an ambitious agreement with the United Kingdom, and not just in terms of doing trade, but also in terms of our cooperation, which is necessary in the areas of security, the fight against terrorism and defence. This second treaty must be built, will be built, upon a balance between rights and obligations, as is the case with all of those agreements that we have already concluded with other third countries. For example, Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein, who have chosen to be part of the single market, to accept their rules, and who make a financial contribution to European cohesion. But I also think of Canada, with whom we have just negotiated a highly ambitious free trade agreement, the CETA. Canada is not part of the single market and therefore has neither the opportunities nor the obligations. And I'm sure everyone will understand that it is not possible, it will not be possible for a third country to combine simultaneously the benefits of the Norwegian model with the weak constraints of the Canadian model. And it's in the light of those principles, which the United Kingdom is very familiar with as it has been applying them for 44 years, it is in the light of those principles that we await with great interest and will study objectively and constructively the next proposals from the British government which we require in order to make progress. Thank you. Let's start with your questions. I will start first with Bruno. Uh, Bruno Waterfield, uh, Times uh, of London. Um, two questions, just very fir quickly. Uh, firstly, Mr. Barnier, the, the, the minutes of the 12th of July Commission College uh, have, have, have been uh, uh, published, and, and uh, the, the discussions were rather gloomy uh, on Article uh, 50. Um, and you uh, noted um, that uh, David Davis, quote, did not direct, regard his direct involvement in these negotiations. Uh, as his priority. These remarks were uh, enlarged upon by uh, the Commission President later on. Do you still um, hold that rather, rather negative assessment of Mr Davis? And on the financial uh, settlement, there was something of a breakthrough before the July round um, when uh, Britain acknowledged that it has obligations that will survive the UK's uh, withdrawal because of concerns that the UK saw the financial settlement as an entrance for it fee into the single market. And I understand that now the lack of detail from Britain on those obligations that survive withdrawal is, is something of a, a sticking point. Can you, can you give us a bit more about what you would like to see in, in terms of Britain fleshing out or explaining its obligations? Um. D'abord, moi, je connais... Euh, des...
Well, to start with, I've known David Davis for about 20 years. Back then, we were uh, both uh, European Affairs Ministers, uh, myself in France uh, and uh, he in the uh, UK. So uh, this was uh, 95, uh, 96, uh, when we were both uh, preparing the Amsterdam Treaty. And I have cordial relations with him still, and uh, good professional relations. And I would add another thing, um, having heard your question, I have one thing to tell you here and now. Uh, seven days ago exactly, at this time, um, we arrived at the end of the, the third round of negotiations and David Davis was standing here and I paid tribute to his professionalism and uh, the, the competence of uh, the whole of the UK team. And I have nothing further to add on that point. Thank you. No, peut-être, peut-être. Euh, euh, on va éviter les émotions. Euh, I don't want people to get emotional. But uh, on a less emotive issue, um, uh, something uh, about uh, facts and figures and uh, the, the legal uh, base uh, and uh, so on. On the financial settlement, uh, it's a very important issue for the 27 member states and for the Parliament. Uh, just to recall, ladies and gentlemen, in 2013, the heads of state and government agreed on a multi-annual framework spanning seven years, which sets out the different policies and the uh, expenditure and the way things are going to be financed. And this agreement uh, was signed by the UK Prime Minister, Mr Cameron. And we collect resources from each of the member states. Uh, that's the system. And uh, this system was ratified by every national parliament, including the UK parliament. So every euro spent uh, has a specific legal base. And if you read our financial settlement position paper again, you'll find all the details there, line by line, all the legal bases uh, corresponding to the different uh, areas of expenditure for the seven-year period, plus other areas of uh, commitment in the medium and the long term. So the Council Legal Service uh, is uh, behind this, uh, the Commission Legal Service uh, as well. They all believe that uh, um, any uh, commitments of the 28 member states need to be honoured by the 28. And this is based on the own resources uh, system. So if a decision was taken before uh, Brexit, um, um, uh, even if this only comes to fruition uh, after a withdrawal of the UK, uh, this uh, rule still applies. Uh, in the past, I was uh, responsible for a regional uh, policy, uh, and uh, I've seen that uh, in the UK and uh, the other 27 uh, member states, there weren't so many uh, back then, but uh, you have uh, projects uh, for uh, infrastructure, a uh, road to infrastructure, uh, transport, uh, universities, and these only come to uh, fruition uh, in terms of uh, payments um, um, several years down the line. So there are thousands of people, stakeholders, companies, citizens, universities, laboratories, um, they have set up uh, their uh, uh, projects on the basis of the, the, the promise made by the 28 member states. So there's a, a moral dilemma here. Uh, um, you can't um, have 27 paying for what was decided by uh, 28. So what was decided by 28 member states, um, that has to be borne out by 28 member states uh, right up to the end. It's as simple as that. So just to respond on your precise question, I've been very disappointed uh, by the UK position as expressed uh, last week because it seems to be uh, backtracking on uh, the original commitment of uh, the UK uh, to uh, honour its um, international uh, commitments 
um, including uh, uh, the commitments, uh, commitments post-Brexit. Uh, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, there's a problem of, uh, of, of confidence here. So what I'm worried about is uh, the uh, uh, credibility of uh, 28 member states uh, signing up to something, um, signing up uh, to the, the commitments uh, entailed by the uh, EU budget. We need to think about the future. We need to be working on a basis of uh, confidence, of trust. So uh, quite calmly, uh, quite uh, objectively, uh, I can say that there's no um, uh, exit bill. Uh, it's not a matter of uh, punishment. Uh, that's not the way I think, and it never will be. But to have confidence, um, you need to uh, uh, balance the books in a, a, a rigorous, objective, um, uh, legal fashion, legally sound fashion. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, the Irish Times. Uh, in, 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 in what you said, you referred again to one of the three priorities in the Irish discussion as no return to a hard border. And you talked then later about how you, the Commission is making clear its view of what sufficient progress uh, in these discussions would mean. Uh, are you suggesting that we have to see progress on that particular strand of the talks? Because my understanding had been up till now that, you, that everybody saw the border uh, issue as an issue for the second phase future relationship talks. Well, you've understood correctly, and I didn't say anything other than that. We have to complete the whole process of explaining a joint position with the British about, first of all, what the Good Friday Agreement represents, and secondly, the conditions for the common travel area. As you know, it's not first and foremost just a question of borders and economic matters. Under the Good Friday Agreement, you have a dozen odd areas, education, public health, other areas where there is cooperation between the two parties, the Good Friday Agreement to which the United Kingdom is co-guarantor. Now, we have made progress. I said this here before. Our discussions have been fruitful but have not yet been completed. So we need to conclude our agreement on all of the political agreements and then at a second, that, that, that's what I mean by sufficient progress as far as Ireland is concerned. And I say this ha having been in close contact with the Irish government. And then in a second stage, when we're finalising the agreement, the new treaty with the United Kingdom, and the second phase will then have to go into the details of all of the technical arrangements. And I'll be looking to the UK for proposals. Because, let us not forget, this whole situation has been created by the sovereign decision of the United Kingdom to leave the European Union, the single market and the customs union. So as co-guarantor of the Good Friday Agreement, and on this we have received guarantees from the British government that they will take a commitment to ensure that the Good Friday Agreement is respected, we look forward to them participating by coming forward with the necessary technical proposals, the detailed proposals in due course. But today we set the scene of what we understand as sufficient progress would be for the whole issue of Ireland. Thank you. Uh Mr Barney, I'd like to ask you about uh, the leaked UK Home Office memo which set out the post-Brexit immigration policy, in particular uh, ending free movement uh, for after Brexit and uh, UK rules on family reunification. If this policy were adopted, what do you think it would mean for a transition deal? Does this mean uh, no European economic area type transition? And and secondly, do you have concerns about the, the status of EU nationals? Well, first of all, uh, on the transitional agreement uh, that you referred to, the debate is evolving. It's developing on this subject uh, in the 
UK, and I'm following this uh, very closely, particularly the discussions that are taking place uh, today. But the UK needs to tell us uh, what it wants, and we'll see what is possible, what is acceptable, uh, uh, while uh, respecting the rules that, that determine the way in which the single market works. But we are uh, open to this. Um, we await uh, suggestions. On the leaks that you referred to, uh, I'd just say that uh, I want to work in a serious fashion, and uh, I would uh, ask uh, our partners uh, to make that possible, to uh, discuss things uh, uh, seriously. And obviously we have to work on the basis uh, of uh, official documents, uh, not on the basis of uh, leaks or rumours. Uh, Mr Barnier, uh, Damien Grammaticus from BBC. Can I just go back to um, your comments in the minutes of the uh, meeting in July? Uh, I understand your, your point about the professionalism of the UK team, but the point you were making in those minutes was about the availability of David Davis, saying he did not regard his direct involvement as a priority. In the last round of negotiations, he was here on the Monday I think, and or the Tuesday, and are back on the Thursday morning. Is that a problem for you, that he isn't there through the whole thing? Uh, uh, could you clarify that, please? Well, I'm very sorry, but there shouldn't be any surprise about this. He comes here because the negotiations are taking place here, as is perfectly normal. It's the United Kingdom leaving the European Union, not the other way around. So we meet up to launch the round every month a little bit more quickly. I'm prepared to pick up the pace of our negotiating rounds. So we're there at the beginning to start the round and then together at the end. But, I mean, I don't take part in all of the negotiations. Well, we leave uh, Michelle you know, Barnier we there, uh, still I taking some team. questions and, in Brussels, uh, uh, saying that the uh, debate is evolving and scene. the UK needs to tell but the uh, remaining members what it wishes to see. Uh, let's show you the scene in the House of Commons right now. For the last three or so hours, MPs have been debating the EU withdrawal bill. It was going to be originally the Great Repeal Bill. Uh, now it's the rather more blandly entitled uh, Withdrawal Bill. Facing opposition from uh, Labour and a gaggle of Conservative MPs who say it gives too much power to ministers. They say much else besides. Uh, we're joined now by the Labour peer, Baroness Taylor of Bolton, Chair of the Lords Constitution Committee. Baroness, welcome to you. Peter Mandelson, Lord Mandelson, earlier this week, threatened trench warfare from the Lords on this <laughs> bill. Is he right? Oh, I don't think that that's what we're about at the moment. What we're talking about today is what the powers are that the government is taking. I chair the Lords Constitution Committee, and we've just issued a report that expresses our concern that the government is actually taking too much power and not allowing Parliament to fulfil its own role. The role of Parliament is to scrutinise legislation and make sure that it is fit for purpose. The way the government is approaching this is causing us a great deal of concern on that basis. So it's not about being pro-Brexit or anti-Brexit. It's actually about being pro-Parliament and allowing Parliament to do its job. Well, to do its job, you would need to scrutinise, you could argue, 12,000 separate yep. items of regulation. Mm -hmm. That would take years. Uh, that would take years. That's why we acknowledge that the government will need some additional powers. But we've actually suggested safeguards to make sure that those powers are not abused. We want the government to be clear with Parliament when it is bringing forward the new regulations, whether there's any change from the existing position. If there's no change, then perhaps it's OK to fast-track them. But if there is a change, then we need to have that flagged up and we make, need to make sure that we've got the parliamentary committees uh, able to look at those and scrutinise them before it gives the government the power. Uh, David Davis says he's given you those guarantees. The Henry VIII clauses will have sunset uh, clauses. They'll be time limited. They'll die off. Uh, they won't all. And there is one very worrying clause, I think it's clause 17, which more or less allows ministers to make an act of parliament themselves without any reference to parliament. So there is a lot that concerns us. And we think that if the government were to take on board the recommendations that we are making, it would actually make for better legislation. And that has to be in everybody's interest, parliament, the public and indeed the government.
Um, uh, the Labour leadership said there will be a three-line whip on voting against this bill. Um, th there are those people, people like Kate Hoey, Graeme Stringer, who, on a point of conscience, uh, disagree with that. Uh, was it right to, to whip this quite so ferociously? I don't comment on whipping in the Commons. I, I left my job oh. as Chief Whip many years ago, so I wouldn't possibly interfere. What I would say is that it's important that we get the bill right, because it doesn't really matter whether you are pro Brexit or anti-Brexit, you should want whatever emerges from this legislation to be workable, to be fair, to have clarity. And we've got a situation where even the head of the Supreme Court is saying that unless Parliament gets these laws clear, then more power will pass to judges because there'll be more litigation and they'll be making decisions that Parliament should be made. So really this isn't about pro or anti-Brexit. This is about trying to make sure that we have a bill that's fit for purpose and a bill that will work in the long term. Uh, and there are erstwhile colleagues of yours in the Commons, people like Ken Clark, who will agree with you uh, and they maintain deep misgivings about this, but there are others and they will continue making this point who will say uh, this is a technical matter and the key mm. thing is the clock is ticking. There is not an interminable amount of time to discuss this in both chambers. The clock is ticking and that is why it's important that the government take on board uh, consideration of new procedures to deal with this. We don't have sufficient committees at the moment. We don't have exactly the right procedures for dealing with this weight of legislation. And therefore, I think what we have suggested in the Constitution Committee will actually help the government as well as helping Parliament. We do not want a situation where at the end of the day the law is not clear or unnecessary uh, changes are slipped through without Parliament or anybody else noticing. What we need is clarity and I think our proposals will help with that. Baroness Taylor, appreciate your time. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Another news and Brexit battle lines are being drawn in the Commons as the government attempts to pass key legislation on the UK split from the European Union. MPs are debating the EU withdrawal bill over two days. It faces opposition from both Labour and some Conservative MPs who say it gives the government way too much power. The combined effect of the provisions of this bill would reduce MPs to spectators as poor power pours into the hands of ministers and the executive. It's an unprecedented power grab. Rule by decree is not a misdescription. It's an affront to Parliament and to accountability. The name of this bill was changed from the Great Repeal Bill to the EU Withdrawal Bill. The word great should have been preserved, but it should have been changed to the Great Power Grab Bill. <laughs> Mr Speaker. I accept that proposing a delegated power of this breadth is unusual, but leaving the European Union presents us with a unique set of challenges that need a pr pragmatic solution. Using secondary legislation to tackle challenges such as these is not unusual. Secondary legislation is a process of long-standing with clear and established roles for Parliament. Well, let's go live now to Westminster and talk to our chief political correspondent, John Craig. Good to see you again, John. So, uh, will the government win? The government's expected to win this vote, yes, uh, because, of course, uh, even those Conservative MPs, many of them who are unhappy about what uh, Keir Starmer called a power grab, a phrase used by Anna Soubry, the Tory MP in Prime Minister's Questions yesterday, probably unlikely to rebel at second reading, although Ken Clark in his speech said he was considering it. He said he was going to do the rare thing of listening to the debate before deciding on how to vote. What we are seeing at the moment is evidence of splits in both major parties, because speaking at the moment is Graham Stringer, a, Man a Manchester MP who is a, a Labour Brexiteer and is almost certainly going to be a Labour rebel. Well, to discuss how th is the debate's going, is somebody who spoke quite recently. That's Hilary Benn, who chairs the Brexit Select Committee. Um, how, how are we going to reconcile the fact that you've got pro-Brexit rebels and the Tories have got pro-Remain rebels? I suspect there's more Labour Brexiteers than Tory Remainers. In the end, John, individual members of Parliament will have to make up their minds about how they're going to vote. The Labour position is very clear. We accept that there is a need for a bill in order to make sure the statute book works. But we think that this bill, the one that's been debated in the House of Commons today, is, I'm afraid, unacceptable because the government is proposing to take for itself quite unprecedented powers, including 
the power by secondary legislation to change the bill that we are debating here or any other act of parliament in the course of leaving the European Union. And the second thing is, I would say is this bill is not about whether we are leaving because that decision was taken in the referendum and was enacted by triggering Article 50. That runs out after two years and we will leave the institutions of the European Union at the end of March 2019. We have to get the statute book right. But the other point I made today is it is not going to be possible to complete the negotiation on all the things that are needed by that date and therefore we are going to have to have transitional arrangements and that's why Keir Starmer set out on behalf of the Shadow Cabinet and the whole party the view that we will need to remain inside a customs union and the single market for that transitional period in order to allow a final deal to be negotiated because you can't do it in the remaining time that is left. I sense that you've probably got a better chance of persuading the government to back down on the power grab argument than you perhaps have on the single market and the customs union arguments. Well, I'm not so sure about that because, look, the government has moved from its original position, transitional arrangements. What transitional arrangements? We don't need any transitional arrangements. And now David Davis is recognising that we need them. It's a very painful journey, I, I have to admit, for Brexiteers on the Tory benches because it's understanding the facts of life, which is these negotiations have been going for, what, six months? It's now 15 months since the referendum. They haven't even reached agreement on the money what to do about Northern Ireland, citizens' negotiations have to wrap up by October next year. So that leaves basically ten and a half months in which to negotiate everything else. Now, no one I have spoken to thinks that that is going to be possible. And that is why the government is talking about the need for transitional arrangements. And if you're going to avoid the cliff edge that British business and the jobs that depend uh, on those businesses say they simply cannot contemplate, the prospects of tariffs returning, obstacles to trade, to data transfer, all of these things. The only way you can avoid that is to reach agreement with the European Union. Right, we remain within the customs union and the single market. Okay, Hillary uh, Benn. Oh dear, a couple of technical issues there, but we definitely got the gist of uh, what Hillary Benn was saying.